Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic today, Tim, mostly because we're coming off of several good conversations we've had with some of our future guests on this show. One of those conversations is coming up, and I'm very excited for everyone out there to hear it. I hope everyone is doing well. You look uh, like you're sitting on a beach on some tropical island? Looking pretty good. How are you? <laughs> sure am. I'm doing great, Lance. And I am also very excited to bring our fine audience this episode today. We feature three lovely ladies, Sheila Wysocki, Catherine Mayer, and Danielle Birch of the Without Warning Podcast. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Without Warning Podcast, we highly recommend it. This is a podcast that is true crime, deep dives, and features three licensed private investigators all coming from different backgrounds. You get to hear how their dynamic plays out and how they use this platform to create a responsible, productive environment as they gather tips and investigate cold cases in real time. Yes, and they do a great job. And you can find out more about the podcast at withoutwarningpodcast.com. They even do meetups and they have one coming up in September of 2022. So overall, a really great conversation. We learned a lot. We had some laughs. I got to say, these three women perform surveillance together in one vehicle, and I would just love to buy her up a recorder because all three of those personalities in such a confined space must be a delight to experience. And Tim, tell everyone what else is a delightful experience. Crawl Space Premium is a delightful experience, Lance, because you get every single episode of Crawl Space ad-free, and you also get our weekly bonus show called The Crawl Space Crypt. And where to go? crawlspace.supportingcast.fm and you can use code crawlspace and get a free month of crawlspace premium so check that out and lance we are going to obsessed fest in columbus ohio and that's coming up really fast sure is that's coming up in just about one month from now september 30th october 1st and october 2nd in columbus ohio we are going we can't wait to see you there Come find us and say hello. And it's very exciting for us because on Saturday the 1st, we will be premiering a exclusive preview of our new show, our original podcast series called Dark Valley. And this is about the River Valley killings that happened between 1978 and 1988, still unsolved. And you can check out this preview again on Saturday, October 1st at 1245. Cannot wait to see everyone at Obsessed Fest. Check out ObsessedNetwork.com and you can get tickets. And if you're not available to go to Obsessed Fest, but you still need your fix of true crime, you can check out the Savannah Crime Expo. That is happening on Saturday, September 10th at the DeSoto Hotel in Savannah, Georgia. And in addition to Crawl Space and Missing being represented there, we will be joined by other shows like Mind Over Murder, LA Not So Confidential, Santa May Be a Criminal, Already Gone, and the list goes on and on. Oh, In the Land of Lies will be there. All right, everyone. Thanks a lot for listening. Follow us on social media at Crawl Space Podcast or Crawl Space Pod. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. Welcome to the podcast, Sheila, Catherine, and Danielle. How are you all doing today? Great. Great. Good. Thanks. Fantastic to have you all on. This is a bit of uh, the max that we can do with having five people on a Zoom, having to consider everyone's internet connection. So looks like we're doing okay so far. Thank you so much for making the time because the three of you never seem to stop. Thank you for having all of us on because... We work together and we do things together and it's important to us that everybody knows it takes a community to do what we do. Yeah, we're a package deal until Sheila and I disagree about things and then we <laughs> we go our separate ways for a minute. <laughs> Just kidding, we don't. Okay, well, tell us about your backgrounds. If uh, if you don't mind, can we go around the horn and uh, ask a little bit about where you've come from, why you are in this field now? If we could start with Sheila. So I am a licensed private investigator. I have been one since 2004. I became an investigator because of my college roommate's murder. And in 2010, the 
perpetrator who murdered her was put on trial and convicted. From that, several families reached out to me and I continued being an investigator. I've been helping victims' families. I only work for victims' families and I'm very specific on what type of case I take and the process that I go through in order to resolve the case. Okay, Catherine, yeah. I came from it on the completely opposite side. And that was kind of one of the things that bonded Sheila and I from the beginning. And I got my graduate degree in forensic psychology. My undergraduate degree was in psychology with a behavioral forensics concentration. And when I was in grad school, I did my graduate internship with the Capitol Defender of Northern Virginia. So I kind of fell into the field by happenstance, got experience working in death penalty defense. So that's kind of how I fell into the criminal defense field. And I've been in it ever since. I started my private practice in 2012 in Miami after working with the public defender of Miami-Dade, Florida for a couple of years. And then I moved my practice here to Austin in 2013. I've been licensed since uh, 20, I don't know, 11 or 12 from in Florida. And then I got a license in Texas and I built Mayor Consulting to kind of include both fact investigation, so private investigation, as well as all the way through being able to conduct sentencing investigations. So we kind of are like a one-stop shop for criminal defense attorneys to be able to hire all the way from guilt innocence through sentencing. Now I got to go after those two. (laughs) 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 Well, um, I actually started out as just a crowdsourcer. I met um, Sheila in 2018 at CrimeCon in Nashville, and she had hosted the PI Experience, which I attended. And the night before, she had several of us at her home to do dinner, meet the other private investigators that had been working on that case that she presented. Sheila and I forged a really good relationship at CrimeCon, and we communicated since then. I helped her on other cases that she was working, eventually became to work for Sheila. I'm now a private investigator licensed in two states. Completely changed my career path from what I was doing before, and I can't imagine not working with her. Danielle holds this entire thing together. Catherine and I, just so you know, the dynamics, I try to put people behind bars. Catherine tries to get them out. So we constantly have that rub. Danielle is the person that is always mediating that moment. And we do surveillance together. We do witness testimony statements together. So the three of us in a car, quite a comedy routine. And Catherine and I (laughs) together is a complete mess. And thank God for Danielle. We laugh a lot though. And by the way, just so that everyone is very clear, that's kind of our shtick that she tries to lock them up and I try to get them out. I am not trying to get people out of jail on a regular basis. I defend them, yes, but there's there's a huge difference. I mitigate sentences. I'm doing the work that has to be done for someone to get a fair trial. All right, well, here's one of those rabbit holes I just can't resist going down. What does it look like between the the three of you, if you're going to be the mediator, Danielle, when there is a moment where, Sheila, you are in support of this person staying in jail and Catherine, you're saying no. Has it ever come down to like a like a specific case? It must, right? So I would say we were Catherine and I were headed to go see a defense attorney and sitting outside of his house, it was a moment where I realized what she did. I'm not a defense person. I believe in a good defense. I want the other side to have the best defense and the best attorneys. Because when they go away, I want them to stay. But Catherine said to me, do you want to be known for the worst moment of your life? And that question, we started talking about particular cases that we're working right now and the horrific crime that happened. But Catherine takes a viewpoint, and I'm speaking for you, uh, they had another life. There, there are good things about them, not all bad things. 
I may disagree with that on most cases. She has a way of viewing people as a whole person. I usually just view the action that happened that brought me to that door to knock on and find out about. Yeah, I don't believe people should be defined by the worst thing they've ever done. Fundamentally, that's kind of my approach. But I also come from a psychological background and education. So I also, as my job as a mitigation specialist, have to help People understand how someone got into the place that they are, what made them do the things they do. So for me, it is a blessing and a curse that I can help explain why things have occurred and mitigate the offense. It doesn't do me any favors in my personal life, by the way, but we won't go into that. So yeah, I think that between the two of us, we ultimately agree with the way that the system is and how things are done, which is what gives us a strong relationship. We have different approaches, but the the challenge that we provide each other is very powerful and thorough. And so I think we both can appreciate our differences and challenge each other to think like the other. And I just want to point out that as I was asking the question, I looked down and Danielle had unmuted herself, ready to be the mediator. Watching Danielle watch the two of you explain this is almost as interesting as the explanations. Tell them where you sit and how you mediate. Being the rookie of the group, it is really interesting to have two very vast different points of view that when I can see each of them come together in the middle and explain their side and the benefits of each of their side, it's really amazing to be on, I guess, my point of view of it because I'm learning both sides of it. And while I might not agree with either one of them, to see their understanding of each other's points of view is really kind of special. Tell us how you all came together to work on Without Warning the podcast together. I needed a private investigator down in Austin. A lot of times I reach out to someone in the community and I posted that I needed an investigator. Catherine responded. I checked her out before I called her and we started talking I flew down there for a case and we hit it off, even though, again, we do have different viewpoints on criminal justice. Even though we both want the truth, we come about it in a different manner. And she's more willing to bend than I am. We spend days together. And when you work cases and you're interviewing witnesses and you're going from one place to another, you start finding out a lot about people. We were sitting in the car, we were having great discussions. And I feel like people should hear the truth of investigations, not the entertainment side, because investigations, it can make or break a case. It could make or break a family if somebody does it wrong or someone puts out wrong information. So we started talking about that. And I love the conversations that we were having. And I said, we let's do a podcast. I already had mine. And I thought, let's try a different route. Even outside of our professions, we just genuinely like each other and get along. And we have a really, really great time. So that was the professional side was almost even a bonus to just having a personal relationship. And then We have, you know, all these ideas on things we want to do together and that dynamic between kind of covering the whole gamut of criminal justice from both perspectives is, I don't know, an attractive thing to me. Danielle, how do you keep your personal opinions out of the mediating? I don't keep my opinions out of anything. Let's hear it. (laughs) Um, Using Catherine's word, I may have to mitigate them. I think the three of us are very strong, independent women, and we have no problem throwing down our side, you know, especially in Danny's case. It was a case that neither one of us really knew about. A different private investigator brought it to our attention, and we really were just going to introduce the case. Well, then we really got into it more, and from the minute all three of us kind of met together as one... Sheila did a work weekend and we all came together with several other investigators and we just forged this bond between the three of us. And I I think it really propelled that 
latest season of the podcast to really work. And that's a good segue. You mentioned Danny's case. Who wants to start with that? Because there's been a lot of extensive work that you all have done on this. Danny's case, like I said, was brought to us by one of her family members that became a private investigator in the same realm that Sheila did. She had a personal interest in the case. As the case evolved and we started doing more episodes, we started getting more tips. And that has always been the number one reason that Sheila has done a podcast in the first place. It wasn't for clout. It wasn't for listeners. It was for tips. And in every single one of her seasons, every case that she's done has generated tips. We could not have expected the amount of tips that we got on the Danny Smith case. And that community is so small. Once it reached them, we had phone calls, we had emails, we had text messages of people wanting to tell us basically what they thought happened, rumors that they heard, facts that they heard, uh, things in the community about the sheriff's department, the police department, people involved. It really took on a life of its own. And we went from maybe wanting to do four episodes on the case to having 12, 13, and, you know, more to come. It wasn't even going to be but one episode. But as you all know from cases, you start looking into it and you are you understand something's not right. And the thing with Danny's case is this poor young lady has a an unsolved case that nobody really has looked into. And the more we have gotten into it and the more documentation we've gotten, it is shocking that there were no arrests, there was no follow-up, that evidence wasn't, that it wasn't processed. And our point is always, let's let the public know so things can change with podcasting let's let the public know the reality of investigations so things can change we can get new laws we have laws that were just signed um by biden two weeks ago you know we're getting laws in because of people understanding what's going on in the criminal justice world that's an incredible side note to the work you've done on Danny's case, because most of the time people want the details of the case itself, and then they start looking into that. But I love the fact that you're also focused on the results of it in the bigger picture. We work cases. I mean, every day we're working cases and either going to trial or prepping for trial. Podcasting's not easy, as you two know. Y'all do it really well. I don't do it well. But I get it out there and I get the results I want. So we get tips, we get laws changed, we get people understanding if they're in that situation what they should do. I don't want to say we're not just podcasters. We have had people in that community saying that we're doing this for entertainment. We are all three licensed investigators. So we are investigators doing a podcast about a case, which is different from a lot of people that you know do a podcast to get the word out. We do it both ways. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. Can you give us some details on Danny's case? So the thing that was the most shocking to all of us was the episode that we did, No Bullet, No Hole. It was Danny Smith was a young lady that a phone call was called in saying that she had shot herself. However... When you go through the evidence and the the scene, and I'll call it a crime scene because it's always a crime scene until it isn't. That's the way the police are taught to process. And there was no bullet and no hole in the truck that she was supposedly shooting herself. Her death was ruled a suicide. The family member that brought it to us had already obtained some of the case file from law enforcement. So when we had begun reviewing it, really dissecting the evidence was when we realized, okay, this isn't going to be one episode. It's probably going to be two. And then two became three. And we just kept on unfolding it. What was shocking to us was the just lack of evidence to support that it was a suicide. The more we delved into it, the more questions we had unanswered. It just kind of snowballed into this thing that 
took on a life of its own, you know, now that's just one of our cases that we're working, I feel like. Did it take each of you some time coming from an investigative background or investigator background to, I guess, explain to law enforcement and to family members, friends of victims? Did you feel like you had to tell your professional story to them? So you're asking us if we have to give credibility. I, th- I think in a way, yeah, good good use of that word credibility because it's coming from a place where, at least on our end, we have to explain how we're not from an investigative background. We don't have a journalistic background. We started it as a glimpse into something that was happening in society, and we really wanted to identify what it was with the people that look into these cases, these citizen detectives, and their passion. So anytime we reach out to law enforcement or victims' families, we always have to give some sort of qualifying element. I think it does help. Now, there are certain states that don't have licensing, which I am opposed to. I I think the licensing is important for the victims because you're not going to be scammed because in the private investigation world, there are people that will take advantage of a victim's family and not do the work. I like the idea of having a license in a state that if you do something wrong, you can be turned in. And if somebody wants to look them up to see if they have problems, you can look and see what they've done. But for us, the cases I take or the cases we get that Catherine's worked with, I have a relationship already with these families. They've already come to me. I am very particular on the cases I take. I don't take every case. We turn more people down, unfortunately, because we only have so many hours in a day than we take. And we're very selective on the families that are willing to go through the trauma of bringing a case in the media, which I now use for, Catherine and I talk about this a lot, I use the media to get tips and information. Her cases, she doesn't talk to anybody. The difference too between the things that we do are all of my cases are pretrial and open. So they're actively being worked prior to any sorts of conviction or sentence. A lot of the times the cases that Sheila is getting are ones in which they have, they're either cold cases, which would technically mean open, or they have been shut because they've been ruled something and the family thinks that they're something else. For her, it's to her benefit that she would use crowdsourcing. I absolutely would never use crowdsourcing. So the only time that I'm involved in anything that we're talking about for the most part is when I'm working with Sheila. Everything else that I do in my private practice is completely confidential and attorney client privilege. Typically for what you do, there's not a benefit for sharing this in the public, this information. You're not hoping to get to put something out there and get something back. Not in any case that I've ever worked in 10 years and not in any situation that I can think of off the top of my head. And on the flip side, Sheila, that's pretty much the main goal of without warning, right? Absolutely. I realized in the very first case I did, Lauren Agee's case, the benefit of putting a podcast out there because witnesses contacted me where before I'd have to track all these people down. Now they're calling me. How great is that? Absolutely. And this is something that you're open to and you're receptive to, and you try to make something productive come of that. You can totally see where both, I guess, strategies are super important and complement each other. The thing that could be frustrating and you don't realize that you're not doing as much productive work as possible is when you are in a group that's all agreeing with each other and it's a big echo chamber. There's no discourse. There's no conflicts. I mean, that's almost more of a red flag than anything else is just like, how how are we all agreeing? We definitely have friction sometimes. There was a case that we all worked Last year, we are still working, and there was a questionable piece of evidence that none of us seem to agree on. You have eight different private investigators, and we're all disagreeing as in the origin of this specific content and what it was and what does it mean. You get a witness that might validate that piece of evidence, and it just kind of fuses all of us together again going, 
it was what we thought it was. In the cases that you cover, I imagine you connect with law enforcement for your investigations. Is that true for all of them? You imagine wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> well, I was going to ask, does law enforcement understand like you do that tips are going to come in? But you're saying not in all cases that you speak with them about. I was just going to say that this is one of the things that is for us the same in that we don't particularly get along, not that we don't get along with them, but we are not in total agreement with law enforcement. And obviously I'm trying to assist in the people they're trying to prosecute. Sheila's typically picking up cases that they haven't done their job. So they don't particularly love us from any angle. Across the board, I feel like they don't wholly appreciate anyone in private investigation. That is a very accurate statement. When they see myself or Catherine or Danielle coming, they know we're going to ask the hard questions because actually we know what the questions are to ask. And a family doesn't. We also know the laws. We know what the state's required to do. You don't want to be put on the spot about your job. And then you start looking at their documentation or the scene, no bullet, no hole. Those are things that they're not going to love that that becomes public because I take things and make them public. We can't change it unless we have the conversation. Law enforcement doesn't work very well with me. However, I have had rogue police officers that have gone above and beyond to help the family and have lost their jobs because they worked with me. And I can account for two in Tennessee. We're working in Texas with a group of police officers. They're fantastic. That's an exception to the rule. Yeah, normally when we come in and do our job, it means that somebody else didn't do theirs. When they're a year away from retirement and we're questioning everything you know, that was done. A big part of our podcast this season was teaching the listeners about their rights. You can do a Freedom of Information Act. You can get the same information that we've gotten, you know, to work the case. And a lot of people don't realize that. They don't realize that there's a statute of limitations on wrongful deaths. These families don't know. And by the time they get to us, sometimes it's too late for them to do anything about it. So if I'm reading between the lines and hearing what you're saying, we all want to defund the police. <laughs> no. Okay, no. I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Oh, God, a, no. It was no, a no, risky no, no, joke. No. I wasn't sure if I should have done it. I went no, for it. Because I'm just, that is so funny you say that because a lot of people say to me, you don't like the police. A lot of my, my partners are former police. I was trained by an LAPD cop. First question I asked him was about beating Rodney King. That did not go over well. There are really good cops out there. When I dial 911, I want the police to show up. So no, we're not defund. I, at least I'm not. Well, I'm sure you don't want to get into the political debate, but I don't think it's as easy as that. So here's Catherine's side. <laughs> well, I think it has more to do with just some of the inner workings and the schooling that they get. I have worked against law enforcement my entire career. Do I want to feel protected by them? Yes. Do I? No. Do I see how it plays out in the system for my clients? And it is, you know, I'm firsthand up front lines seeing some serious misjustice happening across the board on a day-to-day -day basis. If anyone was going to say defund the police, it probably would be me. I just don't think it's as cut and dry. It's uh, the buzzword. They don't they don't sit well with me, buzzwords. Because it's more about an overhaul. Yeah, I like that word overhaul. Overhaul for the system just across the board. Well, and you have to understand one thing. Some of the cases we get are in rural America. A police officer was working at Home Depot one day and then the homicide detective the next day. You've got some training things that need to happen before somebody should show up at a crime scene or potential crime scene. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. Can you tell us 
Why did you choose Danny Smith's case? The private investigator who brought it to us has become a friend beforehand. She knows what it takes and what's going to happen when a case is looked at by us and then also made public. So the person that is in charge of the case, whether it's the mom, dad, or in this case, cousin, they have to be able to put up with the media, what you guys do, your podcasting, you know, somebody looking at the case and saying, oh, those people are wrong. Or on the extreme, you've got people out there that start criticizing the families And so somebody's got to be able to put up with that and go through the horribleness of it. And you've got to put up with people repeating wrong information that they've heard from another podcast. And I'm probably not on the top 10 list of podcasters because some of the cases that are out there, I've investigated, they're wrong about the information. They're perpetrating the wrong information over and over. And that hurts a case. I think that there is an issue that is coming to the surface, hopefully can be identified and remedied. The information that is put out there is like permanent and it'll likely never go away. And in the early days of us doing Missing More Murray, we really went out of our way to correct the mistakes that we were making. And we only made those mistakes because of the information that was out there previous and not having the current access to anything that was developing. We're just starting to see that there are those out there that don't seem to have any desire to correct their mistakes. Well, I'll tell you this, my perception and Danielle and and Catherine, correct me if I'm wrong, but investigations are messy and have hiccups and wrong information comes your way or a file is not given to you. So you don't think it's there and it takes a while. So in Danny Smith's case, we're doing real time investigations on top of our jobs. Things happen. And what we always say on the podcast, if we've got something wrong, call us, we'll correct it. If we are wrong, if you are a witness and we've played something and it's wrong, call us, we'll correct it. I will always correct my mistakes. I think that's such a valuable part of doing real-time investigations in podcasting. I kind of feel like you have to if you're attempting a real-time investigation. I like that you, on Without Warning, will inform the audience. Like One of your latest episodes is titled Waiting on Evidence because that's where you're at. And that's a lot of fun for listeners. They really are verbal and vocal about waiting. They love that. (laughs) (laughs) Just a quick anecdote. We have transitioned our show from specifically covering one person to working more with our nonprofit. And each episode and the follow-up episodes will be about other individuals who are missing. And we'll try to get more information, update later on. But we'll get comments on YouTube. And we haven't specifically covered more Murray in a while. We'll get comments on YouTube saying, episode sucks, do more and more. <laughs> you want us to just make something up for you? Just rehash the details. That's what some of them say. Just we, We'd rather listen to you rehash the details that you've already gone over than talk about this new case. The difference, and this is probably a podcasting moment. I don't consider myself a podcaster. I don't do it well. I know I don't do it well. I don't have all the bells and whistles. However, the information I have is very good and very accurate. When I switched to bring in Danielle and Catherine, people wrote me and I'm like, dude, do you know how hard it is to do what we do every day? We're not sitting behind a a microphone working this case. We're calling a thousand witnesses or knocking on a thousand witnesses doors And then I fit in the night before. I'm like, oh, crap, I've got to get this episode out. And our schedules are all over the place. So, And I'm not complaining. I'm just saying podcasting is very hard. When someone asks me how many listeners I have, I don't know. But I can tell you how many tips I've gotten. One thing I do want to bring up, because I think I've been very critical in the podcasting world, or let's call it the YouTube world, these families that people cover, and then they ignore the family. 
And I've been really critical about that because some of the families I've worked with have given a podcaster who's made their career on the case and then they ignore them. And I've had throwdowns with a couple of them. I, I am not getting Christmas cards from them. All right, this is probably going to offend people. And if I didn't do it on here, it's just not me. But these young ladies with big boobs and blonde hair talking about true crime. They can't even pronounce what's going on and they get millions of views. Are you kidding me? That bothers me. Just saying. Or they regurgitate information that they read in a book and that information might not be correct. How do you balance the real-time investigations that you're doing versus trying to have a podcast business. Y'all, this is the reality of my podcast. I didn't even know how to put it together. I flew up to, I think it was Philadelphia at the time, had help putting it together. And I was flying home and I got a text saying that I made new and noteworthy. And I said, what is that? And they said, oh, you just broke a hundred on the the list. This is back when true crime was in politics and news. And I'm like, there's a list. But when I landed that day, I got a call from someone I had been trying to track down. And then that witness gave me the information I needed. And I got to call the mom and say, that podcast just benefited us by giving us this person. In other words, she doesn't have a very hard time juggling her real-time investigations <laughs> with her podcast. Okay, so that's that's not the priority, I, obviously. It's a byproduct. It's integrated into the formula of her investigations. Well, when you call a police department, they can't find a 911 call. And I say, oh, great. I'll be able to talk about that on the podcast. And lo and behold, that 911 call shows up. That's the benefit of podcasting. All right. Tell us about this crowdsourcing justice. So we had a case in Mississippi, Christian Andriacchio case. Very controversial case for whatever reason. I still don't understand why it is because it's a basic, investigative, simple case. For some reason, it was the perfect storm. There were so many people following it and so many things going on with it. And I thought if we could break it up and I have a home that investigators, I've had 20 to 40 investigators come spend the night for the weekend. We have a ball. And I thought, let's bring in people that are not unreasonable or attacking the family to come in and work on the case and get other viewpoints. So that was the first work weekend I did was the Christian Andriacchio case. The benefit of people staying all weekend, they didn't leave. I had food catered, otherwise they would die of poisoning, but everybody survived that weekend. And we all stayed together working cases in different groups from forensic. I had a forensic guy here to former law enforcement uh, SWAT guy who's amazing and just everybody you could think of. And they all came and we broke up that case. That case is so well documented and so well investigated. If it ever gets to court, which I think it's going to, it will knock the public socks off. So yeah, big market tease right there. You have an upcoming work weekend that is focused on the Jonathan Cruz case that's coming up in September. Yes, we are going to trial. Jonathan Cruz was a 27-year-old young man. There was a phone call made by his girlfriend saying that he had shot himself assuming that means he committed suicide. And I was hired by the family to come in and look at the case. And I've been with that family for, I think it's seven or eight years, but we're finally going to trial. Catherine and I use different tools. Danielle's been with me for several cases. She knows the tools. I have phone information pinging. I have reenactments. I have forensic. I've brought in some of the best of the best. I've gone through some really bad ones, though, too. 
it's you have to weed out. I am pretty hard nosed about my cases. The way I do it, if you watched me, Danielle would probably attest to this. You would think she doesn't know what she's doing, but when it all comes together, it is a masterpiece. And that's what we're going to do in September, show the masterpiece. Danielle, is that the case when you first started? Were you actually thinking this is sort of chaotic? You know, I just went to CrimeCon. (laughs) You know, and I attended the PI experience and she did put on Jonathan's case at the PI experience. And that case is so close to my heart, not only because it really, you know, the trajectory of my career completely changed. And Sheila gave myself and a lot of us crowdsourcers a voice that we could share. I don't want to say a talent for investigations, but maybe an intuition on how to work cases. The fact that she has developed so many people that have become private investigators just from allowing crowdsourcing is amazing. But then I met Jonathan's family, and the one word I use to describe them is always grace. I mean, they are just the best family. Not that we don't want a great resolution for all of the families we work for, but this one, this one just has my heart. And the fact that I've seen it from the beginning at CrimeCon and going to be able to attend the the trial next month, coming full circle is, it's really amazing to watch everything. Yeah. So the families I work for, they're not lucky enough to be able to have criminal cases. So if you work with me, you have to know you're going to file a wrongful death. And unfortunately, to get an attorney, they don't work for free. And then you have to uh, work with other experts and stuff. And the experts I work with, because we have such a great relationships and they know these families are so much of my heart that they really help out. They're just awesome people. One thing I I do want to say about Pam Cruz and the police, this is a woman who goes to the police department at night and prays for them. The people that let her down, she's at the parking lot sitting there praying for these people. Grace is a great word. Yeah, I was actually going to ask to if you can elaborate on that when you said that the word that you use is grace, but that's one of the reasons. That's why that, you know, I, I didn't know if I should say that story, but that is that is why. I mean, these are the people that, like Sheila said, they let her down and let that family down in every way. And she just has grace and hope and has helped other mothers. Pam has been able to reach out to them and to lift them up. And it's it's just really touching. Catherine, what is the importance of making that delineation between the criminal and the civil case? The reason is because the goal typically in the wrongful death civil suits is to get the attention of the prosecutor, the DA's office, so that they then either reopen the case or they actually make some moves on it. It's funny, I'm still learning what I can and can't say from the Sheila perspective, not her personally, but the field of the cases that she works, because For me, it's very cut and dry. I don't say anything to anyone about any of my cases ever, period. And with her and working with her, and I've only been working with her now for uh, less than two years, with the things being open and, and the crowdsourcing and discussion on podcasts, it's all so new to me and very uncomfortable because I'm so used to being tight-lipped about my cases. I never really know what I can and can't say. I've once got a case a very high profile case. And I posted it on my social media because I was trying to sell a PI course. But anyway, I was trying to get some attention. And let's be honest, the social media thing and I don't get along anyway. But I posted this article saying, you know, hey, I got this case. And the attorney contacted me right away was like, take that down immediately. I was like, oh my God, I can't even do that. It's public information. Uh, So anyway, that's kind of one of the even to the extent of me working the case, is confidential. Well, while we were having this conversation, I actually went online and I am now a licensed private investigator. There you go. See how easy that was? How frightening also. Wait, what? No, was- you did not. <laughs> that was easy. It took like five minutes. It was, yeah, it was during one of these pauses where no one said anything. And I was like, okay. And I just went on and yeah. 
Huh. Where are y'all located? Massachusetts. Oh, wow. Nice. Very difficult to get a PI's license as a regular person. You need like background in law enforcement. Oh, you're kidding. That's a strict state. It is pretty strict. I actually did look it up while we were talking. One of the uh, qualifications is you are honest and of good moral character. And you have a podcast. <laughs> If you have a podcast, it overrides everything. <laughs> if you've made the top 100 in true crime, you're in. You're in. I just want you guys to understand, though, the person that's filling out that form, are you honest? Do you have integrity? <laughs> Some of these people should not be checking yes. Like John Lorden. <laughs> oh, <laughs> anybody else but john he's the only one i'll cover i mean he and i sat next to each other in crime con and he and i do not agree on stuff he is the person i'll ask to look at cases to come from a different angle also because he sees things completely different he's wrong but he sees it completely different he's talked about you guys in the past we've talked about who in the industry are good people. So you've made his good people list. And I thought, gosh, if he likes them, they've got to be good. Well, the check is in the mail to him. Is there anything else that uh, that you'd like to mention here on the record before we wrap? No, I just appreciate you guys giving us the, you know, the time to be able to talk about what we do, crowdsourcing and Danny Smith's case. Yeah, thank you for having us. Anytime you have um, a passion case that you might want to come on to specifically talk about, let us know. Oh, I have so many. It would be like therapy for me to be able to come on and talk <laughs> about mine. <laughs> That's a new podcast, True Crime Therapy. Yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> have her lay in the back seat yeah. of the car. Oh, yeah. She gets the back seat from now on. I'm done with the back seat of the car. Oh, that's not going to happen. Catherine, I will tell you this little secret about her. She's pretty much a diva. I always drive and she gives terrible directions. So we're lucky that we're all three sitting here because the last time I think we were in Dallas or Austin and Catherine would go, oh, that's the exit five lanes over but we always safely made it and danielle's always screaming in the back well danielle's locked in the back but anyway it's true we do lock her back there <laughs> i feel like there's a lot here to unpack and unfortunately i'm, I'm actually upset that we're we're uh, touching on this right now but danielle why are you in the locked in the back seat all the time you know you gotta ask them i you know i basically i found out what it was like to do surveillance so We'll put it that way. Two hours in a car in Texas. So this one time we forgot that we didn't have the car on and and Sheila and I were interviewing a witness in the dead heat of Texas summer. And we didn't care because we didn't think it was going to be that long of an interview, but it was actually two hours. And Danielle, bless her heart, was back there and didn't complain and just waited the whole time. No air conditioning. It was off. The car was off. She was in there for two hours, you guys. We were dying outside. The craziest part was it was it was so hot that I got sick in the car on the way back. This is like those stories that you hear. Like if there's a heat wave, you have to say, don't leave your pets, your children and your podcasting partner in the and car. And your investigators in the car. Yeah. We were not going to care about Danielle. We had a witness that we have been trying to get to turn the case around. You were willing to sacrifice Danielle. <laughs> I wasn't gonna getting out of that car for anything. I could have opened it, but I didn't want to blow the cover. So I sat in there and I'm like, yeah, this is, this is real life being a PI, I guess. <laughs> Uh, we got the interview and that's what counts. Yeah. You know what? Here's the thing. We love what we do. We really care about these families. We want to resolve things. And I do appreciate podcasters like y'all that are out there making a difference and helping these families. For us as investigators, I appreciate people knowing about what we really do and the hard work we put into these cases. And I just want to reiterate that although I am working on Danny's case with them, my entire career is still in criminal defense and I still care about all of my clients too. What it boils down to is being a truth seeker. 
finding the truth. I mean, we may approach it from different angles and with a different goal in mind, but it still all remains that we are just trying to find out what happened and get people the justice that they deserve. I think that that can be said across the board. Catherine justifies her existence in the car all day, every day, just saying. Yeah, I've gotten really good at my elevator pitch for a criminal defense, it's true. They keep me on my toes.